Hi everyone. It is October 7th and we are 27 days away from the election on November 3rd. Today's episode will be my fifth interview with the Democratic candidate that is running in the 2020 election. All of us at Ringside Report are trying to do our part to highlight the important voices and issues that will influence the positive outcome we would like to see of this election. I've interviewed Rob Anderson of Louisiana, Zoe Midget of Oklahoma, Devin Pandy in Georgia, and Addie Klein of West Virginia so far, and they've all been amazing. Today, I'll be interviewing Dr. Lisa Welch, who is running in Texas, District 12. This is Kristen Supercrip Malofchak with the Ringside Report Show, and I'm here with our guest, Democrat Lisa Welch, uh, who is running for election to the U.S. House to represent Texas's 12th Congressional District. Uh, the district has been long represented by Republican U.S. Representative Kay Granger, but Welch, who is a Fort Worth professor and scientist with a PhD in re reproductive physiology has concerns about Granger's track record for skipping House votes and being more representative of her party than of her constituents. Welcome, Dr. Welch, and thanks so much for joining us in RSR today. Thank you, Kristen. I'm happy to join you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so first, Lisa, maybe you could start by, and do you prefer Lisa or do you like to be called Dr. Welch? I know that's a hard title to earn so, so <laughs> for to be called. I just hold Dr. Welch for the classroom. You can call me Lisa. Okay. Okay. Um, maybe you could start by telling us a little bit about your background, um, where you grew up. Are you originally from Fort Worth or was that did that come later or how did that happen? Right. So I was actually born in Texas. But I only lived here a couple years and my dad was transferred, oil field transferred to Wyoming. So I grew up in Wyoming, um, did my college years there. And then um, after a year tour in Haiti, I came back, met my husband in Midland through extended family okay. and uh, got married. We lived there for 13 years, went on to Lubbock for four years to get my doctorate. And we've been in this area for 10 years. So 10 years. Okay. Um, tell us about your family and how your decision to run, I uh, was received by them and your other loved ones and friends. Were they surprised? How, how did that happen? Right. So, interestingly enough, I grew up Republican, um, was raised Republican. So, and my husband still kind of considers himself independent. He, you know, he's a liberal at heart, just hasn't quite claimed it on the outside yet. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it, it was a it was a big thing for us to come out and say I'm running as a Democrat. Yeah. Um, so I have three children. Um, they're all grown. My youngest is in medical school. My son is married with a child. And uh, my oldest child is, uh, she has some special needs, so she lives at home with us. Okay. So she's probably the most impacted by me running and, and being all over the place. So, but my husband, interestingly, I came home, uh, I was approached by two students, actually, where they were like, you should run, ex-students. And I was like, well, let me think about this. So I came home, you know, ran past my husband. He was like, eh, hi, no, I don't know. Are you really serious about this? And then about a week later, he came home and he said, you know what? You need to run. There are things that need to change. He goes, this whole cash bill bond thing, that's a mess. You need to get, get in there and fix that. Nice, nice. Especially coming from, a, a, you know, that different background that he encouraged you to run. That's good to hear. Um, so you're a professor and a scientist, and both academia and science seem to be areas that are increasingly and mysteriously, in my opinion, underestimated in right-wing politics. How does this play into your platform and your decision to run? Right, so my decision to run was very much based on the fact that I teach human anatomy and physiology to healthcare workers and that my daughter is a, is a medical student. And we just saw too many cases where people weren't getting the healthcare they needed. I think that people honestly think we're, it's being overestimated how many people are actually 
not getting health care, who are actually injured or disabled because they can't get health care. Um, it happens so much. I had a friend who was all set to retire. They were basically planning the party, and then she got diagnosed with breast cancer and then couldn't retire because she had those medical bills. And we had great insurance. I mean, she worked for college. Yeah. So we're not talking about people who are on the street without health insurance. We're talking about everyday Americans who can't afford their prescriptions or their treatments. And so that was very concerning to me. And then um, with a background in reproductive physiology, the attacks on women's choice and not just wanting to stop free choice, but lying, scientifically lying about what could be done. You know, um, these laws that are requiring you to advise women of things that are actually false that can't be done, like transplanting an atopic pregnancy. It can't be done, you right. know? So I was very concerned that they were just ignoring and rewriting science, actually. So that's when I got in. But then along came COVID and just proved that we need some science. Yeah, yeah. And you actually touched on... Well, that was my next question anyway. Um, so I'm going to go ahead with that. Now, with your background in reproductive physiology, how does the GOP's insistence on pushing Trump's SCOTUS pick, Amy Coney Barrett, through, uh, with, whose conservative beliefs obviously have uh, prompted a lot of concern over the possibility of setting back women's reproductive rights, how does that whole situation um, sit with you? I know that this isn't like, you know, uh, directly impacting, you know, your, your running, but um, just was curious. I just, I find it quite honestly a little bit horrifying that we're going to set women back 50 years. And I think the thing that, I cons that concerns me most is that they think by making abortion illegal that they will stop them. Mm -hmm. And that is not the solution. It never has been. Women have always found a way to seek out an abortion. And what it really does is it makes women who have access to wealth have access to abortions. They're going to leave the state, leave the country, whatever it takes to go get a safe medical abortion. And that leaves your middle class and women who are in poverty seeking back alley, unsafe procedures and they're going to be available to them and we're going to see more and more injuries to women and uh you know that that just isn't the way to go we need to follow science and science says the way you decrease the number of abortions is decrease the number of unplanned pregnancies and you do that through comprehensive sex, ed sex education and availability to birth control as well as empowering women to make decisions about their life absolutely so tell us a little bit about Fort Worth. What is important to the people of your district principle wise and how do you make yourself available to them to learn about you and be transparent um, so they know what you are fighting for for them? Right, so my district is actually pretty unique. Um, a good portion of it's rural and I actually live out in the rural portion of it and then a portion of it's urban. So we're a very mixed district. Yes. Um, but really, I think what's happening is we've allowed this partisan talk to divide us. Because when people sit down and really talk about the issues, they're concerned about their neighbors. Yeah. Here in the rural areas, we take care of our neighbors. And that's really what Democrats just want to happen. We want to take, be able to take care of each other. Mm -hmm. You know, people want to see health care. When you walk past somebody who's had a heart attack, you don't ask them if they've had insurance. You call 911 and you expect them to be tended to, right? Right. So underlying, I feel like we have these true human desires to help each other. We just have to get there, you know? And, and honestly, I, I just think everybody's a liberal at heart. They just haven't quite scraped off enough of that crusty exterior to find it. Yeah, it's interesting with all the hyper partisanship that when you get down to the basics, it's pretty much people want the same things. When mm -hmm. they start talking, um, it's just getting to the point where we can talk again, it seems right. like. 
in my opinion. Um, so you've made some strong statements about your political opponent, uh, the incumbent Kay Granger. What are your specific concerns about Ms. Granger's ability to be a leader for the people of your district? Uh, my concerns is that she has quit representing the people of our district. Um, she now represents large organizations, um, PACs, and her party. Um, she hasn't had a town hall. It's debatable, but really a, a bipartisan open town hall for 10 years. Wow. How can you be representing somebody if you won't talk or listen to them? Even during this COVID ep epidemic, when so many were having virtual town halls, which is so easy, you just do it from where you're sitting. Right. She didn't do that. Um, her voting record has gone downhill. She's now one of the lowest, or sorry, she has one of the worst records for actually voting. She's missed more votes than, you know, most of her colleagues. Mm. She slowed down on actually producing any legislation. So honestly, she's just quit representing this district. And I'm just bringing this up because I don't know how many people that will be watching this haven't seen my previous interviews. Uh, with other Democratic candidates uh, across the country. But it's really interesting because every one of them, when they've talked about their incumbent, has voiced the same exact concerns about, you know, them just not being present, them not communicating with their constituents, them accepting PAC money and corporate money, but not doing anything to communicate with the people and actually find out what their needs are. Um, so it's just amazing to me that you're the fifth person yeah. I've interviewed and it's, it's the same answer as we So, uh, yeah, that says a lot. Um, you know you've also said on your campaign website that one of the ways that you will fight for your constituents is to work to improve the ACA and provide access to health care for all. Can you elaborate a bit on what kind of improvements to the ACA you'd like to see? and how you might expand access to health care for those who don't have it or can't afford it? Right. So um, I've actually studied the history of how the, all the ACA went through and all the kind of broken parts and loopholes and concessions that were made. And we just need to, get to kind of go through and fix those. And one of the big ones was not having a public option. And that was really supposed to be something that was in there. Because when you have a public option, then that does help you determine costs from other insurance companies and make them more competitive. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that people are concerned that if you have a public option that if the government runs it, it will be poor quality. And the way you fix that is just making sure that all your government officials, your congressional members, your um, Supreme Court justices, your senators, all of those are on this insurance plan because they have enough power to make it a good plan. Mm -hmm. Right. They're going to advocate for that public option to be a good plan. So then you have a good public option plan for people to choose that helps us make um, other plans more affordable. Then we just move from there because eventually what I really think we need to see is a healthcare system that's independent of where you work, that you take, it is birth to death. You don't have to be working a specific place to have it. You know, our family is so impacted by that because my husband owns a small business. I have literally worked our entire marriage for insurance. Mm -hmm. You know, the salary was, was extra, but I needed the insurance. You're right. You know, and people need to quit having that. They need to be able to have the opportunity to open us a, a business or to be a stay at home parent if they want to be, but it's driven so much by insurance. Right. So I think starting with this public option is a great way to start keep moving us in that direction. Um, we need to be able to control prescription prices. And Texas, while it's a state issue, they really need to accept that Medicaid expansion that they haven't done yet, which has left 5 million Texans uncovered. Yeah, and speaking from the perspectives of somebody that has Medicaid because of my disability, I find it really surprising. I think there's a lot of misperception out there about like, um, how poor of an insur insurance um, Medicaid is because I was working at one point and because I'm disabled, I had both um, a Blue Cross Blue Care 
uh, plan and Medicaid at the same time. Right. You would be amazed how many times Blue Cross Blue Shield wouldn't cover something and Medicaid picked up the cost. Right. And, it. and I've actually had better coverage with Medicaid than I have with traditional employee or employer um, sponsored insurance. Right. So um, I think there's a lot of fear about it because people just assume right. from the right. horror stories that they hear that, that, that public health insurance is so bad. So and another thing I want to bring up is that people are so worried about how much it's going to cost. How much is it going to cost to cover everyone? And what I want to tell people is that you are already paying for it. Yeah. We literally are already paying for it. If you go and look at how much you're paying for your insurance plan and calculate what percentage of your paycheck that is. I did mine the other day and I was shocked at, at the percentage that I was paying for insurance. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't even counting my employer's portion. Right. We're already paying for it. Yeah. On the and then in the we have so many who aren't, you know, I, my daughter, you have people who go in to the hospital with diabetes because it's untreated, well, because we haven't been covering it, then they end up on kidney dialysis, which puts them on Medicaid, and they're going to need a kidney transplant. Don't you think it would have been cheaper to give them insulin? Yeah, you know, and it's funny you brought that up because I am a type one diabetic, a juvenile. I've had it since I was six years old, and I have an insulin pump that I'm on. Um, but that's always been something that I've had a huge problem with, knowing that in other countries how cheap insulin is. Um, and how here, if I happen to have a vial of insulin and I drop it and it breaks and I have to get a new prescription before or the refill, uh, you know, is set, then I have to pay out of pocket for it. And it's like a couple hundred dollars for a little bottle of it. And um, yeah, it's just, it, so many people have diabetes. Why is this, you know, insulin's been around for a long, long time. It shouldn't be that much anymore, <laughs> in my opinion. But, yeah. um, okay, so I'm gonna move on to the next one. As a Democrat running in a red state, are there any stereotypes you find offensive or unwarranted about what being a Texan means? And if so, how would you attempt to change that stereotype? Okay. So do you mean like other Democrats' perceptions of Texans? Well, and just in general, uh, being Texan, um, being from the South, yeah. um, just stereotypes in general about Texas. Right. I think it's the, they think that everybody totes a gun around, which might be just a little bit true, right? But, um, and that we're just, I don't know, they think we're so close-minded um, and that we're not open to, to change and that, you know, Texans are pretty proud and I guess we get a bad rap for that. You know, we, when you go to a foreign country and people ask you where you're from, a lot of people say, oh, the U.S. No, Texans say we're from Texas. <laughs> right, right. And I think every, every state has a little bit of, um, you know, their state patri patriotism that may make them a little bit, seem a little bit arrogant from the outside yeah. if you don't right. live in that state. But that's just everywhere, right? So, and... Speaking of stereotypes, they say everything is bigger in Texas. Does this include food? I'm a foodie and I love food. Yeah. <laughs> and I was watching a documentary and I saw that the guy that started Chicago style pizza, deep dish pizza, was originally from Texas. And that just inspired them to make pizza bigger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I just wondered, is all Tex is all food in Texas? just automatically supersized? <laughs> it really is. I, I would say that stereotype is a bit true. It, if you don't come away with like three days worth of food, <laughs> you know, you're like, what's this? Yeah, the, the, the portion sizes are enough to take home for a couple of days. 
<laughs> That's funny. Is there, a, is there a particular dish that you would associate with Texas as being like, you know, everybody has to try it if they go to Texas? That's oh, I definitely think you have to try Tex-Mex. So you have to try enchiladas and fajitas. Oh, and brisket. I'd have to say brisket, barbecue brisket is like a f- must try in Texas. Oh, I love brisket. I love barbecue, everything. Barbecue brisket, ribs, all that. So I'm definitely putting that on my list of things yeah. to try when I go to Texas. And, and my husband is so good at, at smoking and barbecuing brisket that I won't eat barbecue anywhere but at home. So... <laughs> Wow, I get that. My mom's Italian, and like now I'm a snob as far as Italian restaurants and everything go. Like you know, all the people that love going to Olive Garden, I'm just like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. So speaking of everything being bigger in Texas, and this one's a little, this is more on the serious side. One of my colleagues at Ringside Report wrote a pretty scathing article about voter suppression. Um, in Texas right now and how the governor, Greg Abbott, has reduced the number of ballot drop off locations in Harris County, one of the highest populated counties in the U.S., from 11 locations down to one, and that he was allowing poll watchers to oversee ballot deliveries as well. And I know you're not running for governor and that you have no control over this situation or any of that, um, but just seeing the vast amount of voter suppression tactics that seem to be cropping up all over the place. Um, Do you have any thoughts as to there being a need for reviewing voting laws or election laws uh, if you were to get an Well, one, I think they need to be more consistent, particularly when you're having federal elections because people get so confused when early voting starts, when can you vote? How do you mail in? How do you get a mail in ballot? Who can get a mail in ballot? How much postage is needed? It's so confusing. And it shouldn't be that confusing. It should be way easier to do that. Um, yeah. Voting should be something that we make as simple as possible because it's a fundamental right. I yeah. mean, we're hiring our government, essentially. Um, you know, There was two things Governor Abbott did. He extended the early voting period to kind of help with the COVID crisis. And then he did allow all these drop off boxes, but then he immediately started backpedaling. And, you know, the GOP tried to sue to get rid of that extra time period for early voting. Luckily it was just, they just um, struck it down. So we do get our extra time early voting, but they did stop all those drop boxes, you know? I mean, Houston is, I don't think people understand how big Houston is geographically, not just population wise, but geographically. To have to drive to one drop box, you could probably have to drive 45 minutes to get to that drop box. Nah. You know, and that's if you have transportation. Texas isn't really well known for great public transportation. <laughs> right. Yeah, um, that's a big, uh, now that you bring it up, um, since you said that you have kind of a mixed urban and rural area, I didn't have the summer questions ahead of time, but public transportation is kind of a big issue that I advocate for more of um, in in the United States. In our area, we have horrible uh, public transportation, some of the lowest funded public transportation in the country. do you see that need as a need as an infrastructure you know improvement in your community right i definitely think we need to improve infrastructure and you talked about stereotypes for texans they love their vehicles you know i mean everybody drives everywhere and they think that's the norm and they really have kind of a poor perception of public transportation but i know i've lived in places that have it and it's just amazing it's like you don't you have that commute but you can do other things during your commute you could actually be watching a movie or reading a book or instead of that bumper to bumper stress traffic um you know you could be doing something else if you're on public transportation so not only does it help with that commute but it helps people with jobs i mean if you don't have a vehicle your radius for being able to find a job becomes very small Mm -hmm. um 
It helps with the environment. I mean, public transportation is just like a multi-win situation. Absolutely. Thank you for emphasizing that. Um, so we talked a bit about your thoughts on healthcare, but what policy positions um, that we haven't talked about do you see as being high priority in uh, the current social, economic, and political atmosphere in your part of Texas today? Right. So I definitely want to hit on immigration. I mean, we are a border state, and so there's a lot of talk about it. And this is one of the things that I think has become partisan and inflamed because Texans really do embrace their Latino background. I mean, we have Tex-Mex food and we have festivals and we have all this stuff associated around that. We used to just be very prideful of that, very proud to have that culture and history. And now all of a sudden we're, you know, wanting to build a a border wall. Um, And I think that's just this, this administration's inflaming you know, and being very biased Mm -hmm. because we know that that's not how it is. Um, You know, I do think we need secure borders because we don't want people, we don't want human trafficking at our border. We don't want to have drug trafficking at our border. So it needs to be secure, but we have so many immigrants that do such vital portions of our job, they're just a huge portion of our economy Uh and we couldn't do without them. And, uh, you know, we just need to be open to that. And what frustrates me about our immigration policy is that they just keep kicking it down the road. Nobody wants to get in there and dig in there and do the really hard work because you're going to have to make some people unhappy. Right. You are not going to fix this without making both sides a little bit unhappy. So they just keep it down the road. The reason that most people come um, to the U.S. though is for work, is for the work, you know, mm-hmm. the job opportunities. So it never made sense to me to attack the immigrants for coming here to work when it's like we've got this shining now hiring sign, you know, on our country, mm-hmm. and we're not making sure that the people that are hiring people illegally and not paying them well because they are, you know, not covered under our laws. We're not going after them because if you take away that, you know, temptation, that's going to make the bigger difference. That's, that's the way I always looked at it while also improving job standards for the average American. Right. We would want, we would, should want all of our immigrants to be here with proper documentation. So they're not exploited. We definitely need them here contributing to our economy. People are talking about how they're taking away our jobs. Uh, They do a lot of jobs people aren't wanting to do. Um, And we're talking about all the time about how we actually have a worker shortage here, you know? So that, that those excuses really don't hold water. Yep, I agree. Um, and another thing that I love talking about, uh, is, besides food and politics, <laughs> are animals. Uh, do you have any pets? If so, what type? What are and what are their quirkiest personality traits? <laughs> yeah. So I have two dogs and a cat, which is probably two dogs and a cat more than my husband wants in the house. <laughs> But um, both, they're all rescues, um, you nice. know, not from animal shelters, but people had them out on, you know, Facebook or wherever. And we have to get rid of our dog. And so that's where we have, we ended up with our two dogs. And then our kitten was some lost kitten that needed to be bottle fed. And uh, so we, we bottle fed the kitten and saved it. So he's now in our house. And my their funniest traits are probably my, my one dog who's a boxer pit mix. When she sleeps, she makes that three stooges snoring sound, you know, the whoop, 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 whoop kind of sound. And I just love it. I lay in bed and go, oh, you know, I just, I don't know. It makes me happy listening to her over there snoring away. Oh, that's so cute. We actually, in the background that you can't see what's going on uh, because it's not on camera. We, 
a little stray kitten uh, my daughter brought him in and she's begging and begging and begging for us to let her keep it. Um, and we've seen him wandering around the neighborhood before this, um, but he came right up to our back door this time. And we want to let her keep it so bad because my husband and I love cats. Um, but the, the problem is, is we have a cat and he's <laughs> the master of the household and we're trying to figure out, like, can we do this or is he going to try to kill it? So yeah. that's, the, that's the predicament we're in right now. But she's, like, bound and determined. She's like, I won't let him and I can keep him in my room. We're like, you can't keep him in your room all the time. But, yeah. yeah. Uh, that, is, that always is a big thing we had because we had the dog and we had a cat. Then we brought in a new dog. And I was like, oh, because they weren't getting along. I mean, it was, it was, it was scary, kind of how not well they were getting along. And the cat had decided to live in the laundry room. And I was like, okay, we're going to get this about a week and see if they can't work it out. And they just worked it out. Um, you know, they, for a while, the cat spent all of its time walking around the counters and, you know, just would walk past the dog on the counter. And then the next thing you know, the cat's walking past the dog and, they got it worked out now. They're best of best, best buds now. I like that. That's optimistic. I like that story. Hopefully something, we can work something out so we can keep it. Because it's so cute. He's so cute. <laughs> um, and so from my final question, um, and I always like to end this way, uh, I'm sure that I didn't cover everything that maybe you would have liked to have talked about. Um, especially if, if your uh, constituents in your district are, are watching. Um, if I didn't ask a question that you would have liked me to ask, what is that question and what is your answer? Um, let's see. I think in Texas, a big question that people want to know the answer to is about gun reform. Because they're just, you know, they're convinced that Democrats want to come in and take your guns away. Well, I was raised in a family who, that hunted. My dad hunted. He brought, I mean, we literally, when I was younger, wouldn't have had meat if he didn't hunt. And so we had deer and antelope and other <laughs> game meat, you know? And so I grew up around guns. We still have guns as a family, but I was always taught to respect them. And I think that's what bothers me today with gun owners is that you see a level of disrespect in the way that they handle their guns and, and this blatant belief that they should have them. Um, you know, it, it's constitutionally protected, but you should be responsible for that weapon. It's, an, it's a, a big responsibility, you know? Exactly. And I just think that as responsible gun owners, we should want to have safety training. We should want to have all guns stored safely. Um, so I think when we talk about gun reform, we're talking about at, le at least getting to the point where we're safe with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think there's also a big misunderstanding about it being a partisan issue. I know plenty of Democrats that love guns and want their guns just as much as Republicans want their guns. Mm -hmm. you know? um, but I, I also think that we need common sense reform. We need to make sure that people are handling them safety. And I like the way that you put it, that they're respecting guns. They're reckon that they can recognize them for what they are, which are meant for killing. That is their purpose, is to kill. So right. that obviously deserves to be something that, you know, we have to uh, have responsibility to handle. So, yeah. Um, but, and that is all of our, my questions. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. And, you know, I feel like every time I have another one of these interviews, I just feel more and more hopeful. Um, I, I feel like the future and the people that are running and the people that are showing up are proving to me that more and more people, uh, average people that relate to their communities and really want the best for their communities are stepping up and doing the right thing. So um, we appreciate you and we're rooting for you.
Well, I enjoyed it and I appreciate you having me on. It was fun. So. Great. Uh, all right, everybody. We'll see you next time and have a great night. Thank you.